Only having five books on the list this year made it a little bit easier for the bookmakers, of course, because we only had to plough through the five rather than the six, and they weren't quite as fat as usual this year as well, which was a bonus. Salman Rushdie at four to five was the first ever odds-on favourite and the hottest favourite ever. The smart money was on Pat Barker, down from seven to one to three to one. Barry Unsworth at nine to two was third favourite to add a full win to his half win. I personally thought Justin Cartwright should win at seven to one, but nobody thought Tim Winton would win at eight to one. He's the complete outsider. The Moore's Last Sigh is my personal favourite. I thoroughly enjoyed that, and and it's a it's a special kind of a book. You know, you can't. The very few people can do that. Nobody can do that really. He is a very special writer, and when he's good, he's great. I have read the Salman Rushdie, which I think is wonderful. I've read Tim Winton's book, which I think is very, very good indeed. But I have to say, I just hope that the best woman wins. Uh, my favourite is Pat Barker's. It, it is one of those books I felt I was driven through the night to read, couldn't put it down, and there's nothing more enjoyable than when you find a book that happens to you. I think it's a two-horse race between Salma Mushti and Pat Barker. I would be very surprised if any of the other three won but I've been surprised before. The book I've hugely admired and enjoyed is Justin Cartwright's In Every Face I Meet, so I'm rooting for that. I'd like to see that win. For the first time in the history of the prize, we're going to see somebody win a second time, and that's Salman Rushdie. I think only Pat Barker is likely to challenge him. Well, I'm not going to pretend I've read them all, and I'm not sure, but I think my head says Pat Barker, uh, and my heart hope it's going to be Sam Rushdie's The Moor's Last Sigh. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's coverage of the 1995 Booker Prize for Fiction, coming to you as ever live from Guildhall in London. We began with a cross-section of opinion from guests arriving earlier for tonight's dinner, which is still going on as you can see. The judges are sitting tight on their decision, which will be announced in just under 50 minutes by this year's chairman, George Walden, the Conservative MP who recently announced that he's to retire from politics, nothing to do with this newly declared outside interest in literature. Before we learn which of the shortlisted authors will be getting a cheque for £20,000, plus of course the inevitable boost in prestige and publicity that accompanies it, we're going to hear all about five of their books. Then Sarah Dunant will be talking about the shortlist with our own panel of judges, who are also right here in Guildhall. Thank you, Tracy. Well, the booker wouldn't be the booker without just a hint of controversy. This year, an apparently happy and harmonious jury still managed to cause a stir when out of an unprecedented 141 entries, that's an average of reading a novel a day for five months, they only picked five instead of the usual six for their shortlist. Where, declared many commentators, was Martin Amis, a question which his publishers were no doubt also asking, since they had recently paid a heavily publicised half a million for his novel. The Booker, of course, has always been a tantalising marriage of art and mammon, but mammon was much in evidence this year when the smashing of the net book agreement in October meant that all five shortlisted books could be sold at a discount, a fact which has pushed up sales by an estimated 7%, with Salman Rushdie doing particularly well, though he still has a way to go to catch up with Delia Smith. In a moment, our own panel of judges, Howard Jacobson, Michelle Roberts and Bill Buford, will give you their opinion of the novels on offer. But first, back to Tracy McLeod and the five writers. Thanks, Sarah. Well, four of the five shortlisted authors are here tonight. The rest of the gathering is made up of people from publishing, business, politics and the media, including some well-known names. From the world of politics, the Right Honourable Virginia Bottomley, Secretary of State for National Heritage. From the arts, Dame Elizabeth Estevé Cole, formerly director of the Victoria and Albert Museum and now vice-chancellor of the University of East Anglia. From publishing, Sunny Mater, head of Knopf in New York. And Carmen Khalil, writer and founder of the just-sold women's publishing house, Virago. Regular attender Ben Ockrey is here. He won the Booker Prize in 1991 for The Famished Road. The writer and chair of the 1992 Book of Judges, Victoria Glendinning. And from television, the presenter, Mariella Frostrup and the chairman of the BBC, Marmaduke Hussey. And now the shortlisted authors. Pat Barker is the only woman on the shortlist this year. She was born on Teesside in 1943 and still lives in the North East in Durham. She apparently just missed the Booker shortlist in 1993 with her last novel, Eye in the Door, which did win her the Guardian Fiction Prize, 
and was the second book in the First World War trilogy which began with Resurrection and which is completed by her shortlisted novel this year, The Ghost Road. Pat Barker is the second favourite to win with closing odds of 3 to 1. Justin Cartwright was born in South Africa and educated in America and at Oxford University. He now lives in London and in every face I meet is his sixth book. Set on a single day in 1990, it's the story of a 41-year-old businessman who gets involved with a 19-year-old prostitute and her pimp. The bookmakers have Justin Cartwright at 7 to 1. Barry Unsworth lives in Italy and is unable to attend the ceremony this year. He's already won the Booker Prize. Two years ago, his Sacred Hunger shared the prize with Michael on Dutch's The English Patient. And he was also shortlisted in 1980 for Pascali's Island. The closing odds on Barry Unsworth were 9 to 2. Saman Rushdie has now been in hiding for six and a half years since the publication of the Satanic Verses. He too is a previous Booker winner, back in 1981 for Midnight's Children. He was also shortlisted for Shame in 1983 and won the Booker of Bookers for Midnight's Children two years ago. His shortlisted novel, which he's referred to as his first grown-up novel since the fatwa, is The Moor's Last Sigh, and it's the hottest ever Booker favourite, with odds on at four to five. Tim Winton is 35 and the youngest author on this year's shortlist. He was born and lives in Australia. The Riders, his sixth novel, is the emotional tale of a young father's attempt to trace his vanished wife. But the bookies don't fancy Tim Winton's chances much. At 8 to 1 against, he's the clear outsider. Well, those are the shortlisted authors. Now back to Sarah Dunant and her guests. Thanks, Tracy. Well, in less than 30 minutes, one of those five is going to be walking away with a cheque for 20,000 quid. The decision as to which one was made a few hours ago after a long, secret, but apparently harmonious discussion among the judges. Our discussion here now will be public, short and possibly brutish. With me are Michelle Roberts, who was sitting out there at one of those tables three years ago when her own novel, Daughters of the House, was shortlisted, the novelist and critic Howard Jacobson, and Bill Buford, former editor of Granta and now the literary editor of The New Yorker. The first two novels up for discussion tonight are Barry Unsworth's Morality Play and Justin Cartwright's In Every Face I Meet. Barry Unsworth's Morality Play is set in a bleak, plague-ridden 14th century England and tells the story of a renegade priest who joins up with a group of travelling players trying to earn the money to bury one of their dead. Their journey brings them to a town where a murder has taken place and to rustle up a bigger audience, they decide to incorporate the story of the murder into their religious play. As we began to come into the town, we made of our progress a drama of sound as well as sight. Demons and angels contended with music. Springer played his reed pipe and the serpent a vial, while mankind beat time on a drum. And God marked the intervals with a tambourine. The suit of hair was hot and close on my body. The mask made of paper, pressed and glued together, was thick and airless. I had to remember to jab with my trident and hiss. This is about the power of art, about the players, their role in society. It is also a murder story. A very, very unpleasant murder takes place. And the players, through their art, are able to solve and track down the murderer uh, in a way that nobody else in the town has been able to do, thus showing the power and redeeming power of art. And, of course, the bright bright stage and the, the theatre and the fantasy that the artists create is in contrast to the bleak surrounding of everybody else's lives. Adding to my disorder of mind was the sense that my mask and ancient mangy horsehair suit were redolent already of Brendan's decay. It came to me that perhaps my mask and suit had lain next to his corpse on the cart. His odour we were obliged to hide as we had hidden his body. We brought death into the town, so much is certain. Death rode with us on the cart. He was there in the midst of our panoply and fanfares while we wooed the staring folk for their custom. Certain too that death waited for us there. By God's grace I came out from the town again. Death waits for me still. But time has done nothing to dim the memory of it. The clamour of our entry into the town, the close mask and evil-smelling suit of Antichrist, and the fear of dissolution. London in 1990 is the setting for Justin Cartwright's novel In Every Face I Meet. 
The book follows 24 hours in the parallel lives of a black prostitute and her pimp and a middle-aged company director, Anthony Northleach, a man with an ailing marriage, an unsuccessful career and a sustaining desire to go to South Africa to be close to his hero, Nelson Mandela. Anthony Northleach stands on the platform waiting for a train. He's full of expectation. He's pumped up with it. For a start, England have beaten France 26-7 in Paris. And also the government in South Africa has announced that Nelson Mandela will be released soon. The doors open unwillingly. They shuffle in. Anthony, always performing a stock-taking, scanning the faces of the women for human signs. He reads the times and looks at the swaying faces at the same time. They sway in unison like seaweed as the train speeds. How fast, who can tell? Through the exhausted soil of London, down the furred arteries of the city. At the end of the 80s, people were looking for new values. And above the wreckage, I think, stood Nelson Mandela. Clearly, for better or for worse, people think and thought then that Nelson Mandela represented a sort of higher plane of value. The challenge was to write about somebody who was interested in spiritual values, interested in what was going on around him, basically probably quite a decent sort of person, but wasn't in any sense an intellectual. And I tried really to concentrate on one day in his life. Although he's never come right out and said it, Anthony believes that Nelson's been thinking about him just as he's been thinking about Nelson. There is a two-way traffic in these relationships. Souls, if we have them, must be able to communicate. Well, let's begin with Barry Unsworth's morality play. Howard Jacobson, he won two years ago with another historical novel about 18th century slavery, very dark. If it's possible, this is an even darker book about the medieval era. Do you think he stands a chance of winning with this? I so wanted to begin by saying something positive. However? So I'll say he gives very, very good snow. There are some terrific descriptions of snow heaping and drifting and how sounds echo in snow or at other times are muffled in snow and that's not nothing. Thereafter I fear it um, perishes in its own period pastiche. It's one of those books isn't it that it's terribly risky to do because you're going to end up being, you're going to end up writing one of those period schlock books instead. And there's a certain moment I think when, the, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think somebody comes in, but it might be the crowd addresses the, addresses the players and says the monk is dead when you feel you've moved out of a Booker Prize book into another world of schlock. But the pages turn, the pages turn fast enough. If that's what you want, there's a whodunit quality. And... Well, I was going to say the pages turn partly because he's written a thriller as well as a historical novel. Michelle Roberts, were you equally unimpressed or did you like the snow? I love the snow, Howard's quite right. Also, I love the thriller because I love reading thrillers and this is a real page turner. You want to get to the end to find out who done it and I think that's great to be able to tell a story that keeps the reader's interest like that. The problem for me was the language. It's over archaic, it's too much of a pastiche of a fake medieval language. And really, the, the, the real problem is not even the way this guy is talking as he tells the story, but why is he telling us? We're supposed to believe, reading a written well, in text, this priest, yeah. yes, that we're hearing someone talk to us, that we've got a window into his thoughts. And I'm completely unconvinced. I wanted to have the manuscript given to me by a bishop or a member of the Inquisition, and that doesn't happen. So in the end, I lost faith with the writing. I'm going to stand out of it, I thought it was incredibly strong on atmosphere, actually, as well as the snow. I thought the sense of a world that was always dark, the sense of a frozen world, the sense of the filth, the cow dung, the decaying flesh. I thought there was a kind of seventh seal quality to the atmosphere. Yeah, but that's how, a little... However, isn't Bill that, Buford, isn't that you verging a little bit on sentimental camp? Now, there, there's something yeah. about the medieval... No, there's something about taking a medieval subject. It's, it's far enough away where you're never checked by everybody's sense of reality, but just close enough where you can get these evocative images of play victims and players and yeah. the dark medieval in the snow that I mean it's fun I mean camp is fun and I, and I enjoyed this as kitsch it was a fun read of very little ambition and virtually no thought at all but it it is it's 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 a it read to me like a parody of Umberto Eco with maybe a little bit of Ridley Walker in it I mean it was it was fun but I think Howard's right it's 
it's, it was an enjoyable book to read, but not a book you want to consider seriously as a book or book, not a book you want to judge as one of the year's best literary titles. He's certainly trying to do something more substantial than the thriller, isn't he? He's making an attempt to write about theological questions, about the moment when the word of God turns to the word of man. You were clearly, you two were clearly both unimpressed by that moment. But even in the show? neglect and squalor of that place, she was beautiful to look upon. The women I know that's have not a hard time of me, in that thank book. you, Howard. The yeah, women are sure. all whores, but actually the theatre has a hard time. The theatre at that time was not capable of reproducing normal daily life. It was too early. They were doing plays on carts, they were using frames, and they were doing religious subjects. If you know anything at all about the history of theatre, you cannot buy the thesis of this novel. You know, and I've always been intrigued by the mystery plays, because the source of this is the mystery plays. I've always, I've always been struck by this curious thing. They have the Greek tragic theater and then you've got Shakespeare and in between you've got this stuff which sounds really really tedious and I thought well maybe this will reveal that in fact it isn't really really tedious but in fact it's clearly that it was just very very tedious and they were all simpletons who spoke in very very sententious language and drank thin beer it's Fair not enough. the middle ages I think you have all had your fair say on that let's then move to the second book on the shortlist which is Justin Cartwright's In Every Face I Meet now this is clearly at some level trying to be a sort of state of the nation book in late Thatcher England in 1990 Bill Buford, were you convinced by it? It's a London book, it's, and we're sort of familiar with London books, and Margaret Drabble did it when she wrote novels, and Melvin Bragg does it, and of course the, the ghost of this feast, the banquo of our event, does it rather well. I don't want to mention his name yet, but everybody knows the information about him. Um, this, to me, was derivative, familiar, um, and there's so many things that a novel can be, and th but this is the novel of the situation, really. I mean putting apart sort of the climax at the end. It's, you, you, you put a man in a situation and the, and the success of the book rests on its wit, its sentences, and its thought. And this is the very familiar thought of the middle-class London professional in his middle-class unhappiness, his unhappy wife, his unhappy business being a parent, preoccupied by masturbation, and possibly a vague longing for something intense and passionate. I'm getting a distinct impression that you like this even less than the Barry Unsworth. Michelle Roberts, it's a difficult character to, p to pick out just because it's such an ordinary man to bring alive. Do you think he did Well, that? no. Ordinary men are complicated and deep and fascinating and one spent hours talking to them but this guy is not deep he sees women for example only below crutch level all the women are described as legs and nothing else so for a novel that purports to be about the loss of spiritual values he's got some way to go but to, to be rediscover fair, he them. said he didn't want to write about an intellectual he was trying to write about someone else Yes, but I think he does men down. I think he gives a terrible view of, of masculinity and the masculine imagination. I was deeply saddened by this book. The writing is unoriginal, it's soggy, it's limp, it's full of cliches about business, which we've all heard too much in journalism, I think, to find interesting in a novel. It's also full of um, really horrible pictures of, of low life, full of contempt. I resent the way this young prostitute woman is given her language, spelt out as being obviously a sort of London accent. It's spelt out. Everyone else is allowed to speak normal English. Right. I found I, that so offensive. I feel a volcanic move on my right yes, here. It's a volcanic Jacob. move. I mean, I think, that's, I think that's tosh, and I think that account of what that character thinks about women is tosh in, in the usual general ways that that point is tosh, but also in specific ways. This, this for me, is, is, this is the book I like most in, uh, of the I list. Like I think it. it's the most intelligent book. I think insofar as the pleasure of reading a novel is that you go along with the mind of the novelist, then this is the mind I find most congenial. That probably won't surprise you. I think it is the most intelligent mind. Howard, I don't believe you. I think it's the most sympathetic <laughs> mind. I think it's the saddest book going. I think it's a book full of not jumped-up omens, as there are in the Barry Unsworth, with people going, it was, I knew something terrible was going to happen. This just is a slow accretion of sadness. It's a kind of cataclysm of the commonplace. It's, it's an ordinary Rugby. day in an ordinary... And it's all about slippage, misunderstandings, how people don't get you right, how the best will in the world is misunderstood. I thought it was unbearably sad novel. Bill and Bill the person you still that's been not believe I, I must have got the wrong book. I think I got the, you have I, got I, the I, wrong book. I knew book. I was in New York. Someone was, I don't believe you, Howard, because this kind of writing, which rests on its wit and its sentences and its cleverness and intelligence, is so much the kind of writing that you do that I cannot believe you would fall for this. I think it's it's soft and it's, it's full of grammatical errors. The sentences this are This is sharp. so much the kind of writing I do. <laughs>
I, I don't, it's the kind of book that you would do, but you do so much better. No, stop flattering him, discuss no, the book. That's a canny way of no, undermining. I think, I think that's that's a, I, if I may be so bold, I think you're Briefly. being a sap for a kind of book, not well, the Well, I think book. it does have wit, and I think it's the only novel on the shortlist that is a novel of wit. The only novel that made me laugh. That's okay, a well, relative statement. We'll ask, we'll ask you later whether or not you put money on it and put your money where your mouth is, Howard. Let, let's now move on from those first two books to the next two books on the shortlist, and they are Pat Barker's The Ghost Road and Tim Winton's The Riders. Pat Barker's The Ghost Road is the final book in her acclaimed trilogy about the First World War. Mixing fictional and real characters, it's told largely through the diary of Billy Pryor, a working-class bisexual soldier treated for shell shock by the real-life neurologist and anthropologist William Rivers. It's a novel which explores death, masculinity and the trauma of war. 19th of October, 1918. Marched all day through utter devastation. Dead horses, unburied men, stench of corruption. Sometimes you look at all this, craters, stinking mud, stagnant water, trees like gigantic burnt matches, and you think the land can't possibly recover. It's poisoned. Poisons dripped into it from rotting men, dead horses, gas. It will, of course. Fifty years from now, a farmer will be ploughing these fields and turn up skulls. The Ghost Road's about the closing months of the First World War. Everybody knew that the war was going to be over in a matter of weeks, if not days, and yet this final terrible slaughter still went on. The war was sold to the men as this enormous great adventure and then they found themselves sitting in holes in the ground, waiting for a shell which at any moment might kill them. I told Rivers once that the sensation of going over the top was sexy. I don't think he believed me. But actually there was something in common. Racing blood, risk, physical exposure, a kind of awful daring about it. Obviously I'm not talking about sex in bed. But I don't feel anything like that now. There's for me a constant nagging apprehension because I'm out in the open and I know I shouldn't be. New kind of war. The trouble is my nerves are the same old nerves. Tim Winton's The Riders is the story of Scully, a gritty, good-hearted Australian who at the whim of his pregnant wife Jennifer decides to settle his family in Ireland. But when he goes to Shannon Airport to meet her and their seven-year-old daughter Billy, the only person there is his silent and traumatised daughter. Jennifer, his wife, has disappeared. And so begins Scully's increasingly desperate search across Europe to find her. It was late. His eyes burned. But there was no question of sleeping. No chance. Not till this was over. Till he knew Jennifer was all right. Carefully, he lay beside Billy and held her outside the Eiderdown felt her hair and breath against his face. In the band of moonlight that grew on the far wall, he saw the flaws of his hurried lime wash. The long, relentless, unpeeling of the night went on. I guess I was writing about a, a father who's actually passionately committed to his child, um, almost to a point where he's excluded his wife. He's stuck in a wrong landscape which haunts him, um, interferes with his mind, if you like. And uh, the book is, a, is a, I guess, a search um, for and with this man through Europe f for himself and for reality. He's completely alienated from um, all normal things. Everything has fallen over. Beneath the Pont Neuf, he stepped among these people and whispered her name. The stoned and sore and crazy rolled away from him. Billy tugged at his hand, but he stared into their eyes, ignoring their growls of outrage, until a big, gap-toothed woman reared and spat in his face. Billy dragged him out into the faint light of day. She sat him down in the square at the tip of the island and pressed the gob away from his face with his own soiled hanky. Well, let's start with Pat Barker's The Ghost Road. Um, Michelle Roberts, 
for the six year running, she's the only woman on the shortlist. Um, and she's writing a book all about men. How well does she do it? Well, I think of all these writers, she does it with the most compassion and the most warmth because what she's trying to show is how much pressure and stress there was on men in the First World War to live up to the notion of heroism and how impossible that was and how they were patched up and sent back in. I think she's done something quite amazing about showing what goes on under the surface of macho behaviour. She's also done it with a lot of wit, there's a lot of humour in this book, there are funny scenes. She's got a marvellous hero in Billy Pryor who swings both ways so that we move from him having it away with his lady love behind the sofa in the, in the mother, mother's house to him doing something equally amazing and delicious on a canal bank with a young soldier in France. And there's a wonderful scene of anal sex in which we get the smell of an asshole like old chrysanthemums in water. What an imagination the woman's got. Actually, it's interesting you should say that because there's not a lot of very conscious style in inverted commas in this no, it's book. It's very quiet and economical. And press. I think she's a very modest writer in this book. It's very unegotistical. She keeps herself back. She tries to be that camera. And I think it works. Bill Buford, I suppose the question is, it's part of a trilogy. Does the book stand up on its own also? I think it stands up on its own. There's no question that it's better completing the trilogy. And I was struck, as you were, Michelle, by the writing. I hadn't, to my shame, read Pat Barker's writing since her first two books, Blow Your House Down and Union Street, which are very sort of coarse, uh, broad, passionate, rough books. And this is very refined, very pretty, very restrained writing. Um, I still can't understand why I'm so embarrassed by the books. I thought there was no reason for them being written, and I felt they were pretty in the way that a BBC costume drama, BBC co costume dramas are pretty. It, it reminded me of the, it reminded me of Middlemarch. So, was, wait, so you don't think she's penetrated any further into an analysis of the First World War? Is that what you're why, saying? I, I don't know how someone can plunder history, especially a history covered so well by so many great writers, so many of the writers that actually figure in the narrative itself, without some sense of incorporating the history. And it's, it, it's, for me, this, this, this was as if um, it was as if the rest of the 20th century didn't exist and it was exploiting history. I felt very uncomfortable with it. Oh, I think she's making a very clear point that this is where civilization breaks down in the 20th that's century. Been, that's been made 80, 70, 60 years. That's been made by the okay. very writers right. she writes about. I mean, right. that's, that was made greatly by you, Graves. A lot, lot, a lot to say here. I understand some of Bill's anxieties there. I don't think it's a pretty book. I don't know why people are talking about it as a pretty book. It doesn't remind me of Middlemarch at all. I actually found it a very difficult book to enter because I hadn't read the first two. Um, and I found it difficult because because I thought far from it being sweet or pretty or anything like that, it, was like, it felt like a novel written on sandpaper. I found the grittiness and the bleakness very hard to take as long as we were out of a wartime situation. England, while the war is going on, but back in England, all the description of sex, rudimentary, heartless ribaldry. I couldn't get it at all. I didn't like, I didn't like the description of the bleak description of people's sexual organs whenever you met them, the first thing that you saw. I, didn't, I don't know whether that's native to her or whether she was going for a grittiness. But anyway, once you actually got to the war, I thought some of the most unbearable descriptions of, of war I've ever read. But what saves it from being, what, what saves it from the question of, well, what's that for, is the anthropology. There's an anthropology, there's an anthropology section running through with one of the characters remembering his time with the headhunters. And the headhunters have been denied the right to headhunt. And they've lost, they've fallen into lassitude. They've lost all their rights to their society. And I think that bleeds back into the rest of the novel wonderfully. But he's so not a not character, he's, not a character he's an historical figure. Rivers is a great anthropologist yep. and psychologist. Yep. Rivers is the man matter? behind grave. Well, does it matter that he's a real figure rather than a fictional figure, as long as she brings him alive? No, it doesn't matter, but usually there's a sense of a summer kind of critical self-awareness. I just felt it was exploiting people who have done all this much better than she's already done it. I completely disagree. Very briefly, Michelle. I think she's bringing to bear a, a sort of womanly perspective that draws on Freudian ideas, feminist ideas, anthropological ideas to say something quite new about the state of mind of men in the trenches. All right, well, let's leave it there. That's Pat Barker's The Ghost Road. Let's move on to Tim Winton's The Riders. This is the book about the man who goes to the airport, finds his wife isn't there and pursues her all over Europe with his daughter. Now, Howard, you were once an Australian. He's an Australian writer who's yeah. won most of the major awards in Australia. He won how most of them before he was about 10. How much, how much did you like the book? There's a sentence at the beginning which goes, Scully hacked grimly at the claggy ground, which I laughed at for about four hours. And for a while, the novel felt like that. What's he called Scully for? You can't read a novel with a person called Scully hacked grimly at the... It felt like what the book... The book felt as though it was hacked, hacked at grimly. 
But then it gets very exciting for a while. I think it got terrifically exciting about um, not just in the page turning way, but because you really you really felt that this was a story of a of a misconception of how difficult it is to kind of get hold of somebody that you thought you you knew very fast, very exciting, and then it gets lost again in all that claggy ground stuff. He needs a good editor. All right, okay. I should say as we're talking here that you don't worry, they're not actually giving the result out there. There's another speech going on, but you may have to lift your voices to compete with it. Michelle Roberts, what did you think of it? I want to praise him for his energy and his love of language because too many novelists see prose as a glass window and you don't have to think about it. He's really digging for his prose and I liked him. He's digging for victory. There's a real problem with this novel in that the absent wife never exists at all. She's someone he's so passionate about that he chases all around Europe looking for her. But we never get to know about her. There are hardly any memories of her. She's clearly someone he didn't actually like very Why much. Does that matter? It's not a novel it matters about her. enormously. It's, not it's a novel, a novel about, about him on a quest for a vanished wife. I didn't believe that she mattered at all to him, so why is he bothering? I thought the whole novel was beautifully set up as a series of narcissistic portraits of this guy to say, he's good, he's good, he's lovable, he's a better mother than Jennifer yeah, would ever yeah, have been. Fathers are good. Yeah. No problem with that. That's the message of the book. Bill Beautiful. Fiction is so preposterously subjective to judge. I mean, it, it, it is... Non-fiction doesn't have those problems, but it, it's extraordinary that we get three different views like that. I mean, I read this and I just thought, something happened to these judges when they were reading 141 books and their judges went completely soft. I can't see how in the world they would have selected this book. I tried very hard to think of something good to say, and I could think, well, he's got clean sentences. Usually he uses the right word, but to me this was a short story blown up to a book. It shouldn't have been a novel, it should have been compressed much more, and I found it spectacularly uninteresting. It's a very powerful portrait of this central figure, though, who a bit like the Justin Cartman well, figure is that's, an that's ordinary the person. Because I didn't find any power in it at all. Well, it's quite hard. I just well, I mean, I, I'm now going to have to save it, Abba. No, I, don't, I actually don't want to save it. Uh, I, I think it's very trash exciting it. for a while. No, I won't <laughs> trash it. It's too good for that. It is very powerful for a while. He's a writer who, who overwrites. He's in the Australian pioneer on a bursary tradition. There's a lot, there are two strong Australian traditions. You've got your mystical pioneer kind of writer, half earth and half visions, and we've got earth and we've got visions in this. And then you've got, well, we've got great literal Australian, visions in this. We should say there's a we've supernatural got the element. comic tradition, which the book never, ever honours. The book never honours comic writing anyway, and it certainly never on as the Australian comic writers. So we think of this as what the only thing that Australians do. And he's, I mean, he's caught in it. We've got, we've, the book wrapper has got, has got um, Thomas Keneally saying, this is a novel that transcends the known world. The trouble with Australian writers is if they're at all good, they blow too soon. He's had heat praise heaped right. on him and he needs a bit of help. OK, we'll and leave he's that. on the way. Thank you. I'm sure he'll be delighted to hear that, Howard. Thank you very much indeed. Away, that is now four novels. There is one novel left to discuss. It is the fifth and the final book this year, which, of course, according to the bookies, is very much the favourite. Salman Rushdie's The Moor's Last Sigh is an exuberant family saga following the fortunes of a dynasty rooted in the spice trade of Cochin in southern India. Narrated by the remaining son, the Moor of the title, the novel brings to life four generations, and is set against the backdrop of 20th century Indian politics. Mine is the story of the fall from grace of a high-born crossbreed. Me, Moray Zogoibi, called Moor. For most of my life, the only male heir to the spice trade and big business millions of the Dagama Zogoibi dynasty of Cochin, and of my banishment by my mother, Aurora. It's a novel about a mother, a father, and a son, and, and about what happens between the three of them. The mother in the book is artistic, dominant, very powerful, very sexy woman. Um, the father is a person who changes. I mean, he begins as a kind of hero figure, and he rapidly darkens into... Um, very powerful, but very corrupt figure. What happens to Moore at one, sort of at a hinge moment in the novel is that he's expelled from his family, I mean, he's disowned. And there is a lot in the book, I think, about loss of, of home, of family, um, and, and above all, I think, of love. I, mean, I think it's a book, it's a book about, about getting and losing um, love. Now, therefore, it is me to sing of endings, of what was, and may be no longer, of what was right in it, and wrong, 
a last sigh for a lost world, a tear for its passing. Also, however, a last hurrah, a final scandalous skein of shaggy dog yarns and a set of rowdy tunes for the wake. A Moore's Tale, complete with sound and fury. Bill Buford, six and a half years coming, very traumatic years. Was it worth the wait? I think this is a great book. I think this is um, a book which is so much better, more developed, more, more ambitious than not only anything else that is on the shortlist, than also anything else that's been published for some time. It's, um, it's, a, it's, it's not an easy book. It's a demanding book. It's a very compacted prose. It, it makes the reader work, but it brings in history and humor and politics and his own situation, the conflicts of East and West. I think it is really a very great book. Salman Rushdie is unusual among writers in being able to address two continents at once. And this was the thing that uh, most of us here in the, in the West missed with the satanic verses. While it was being criticized for this and that, there was this whole other text that was being read in the East. And the same is with this book. This book is constantly addressing two continents at once. And very few writers have been able to do that. Conrad was unable to do it. Nabokov was unable to do it. I think we're in the presence, really, of something very, very grand. It's interesting you should mention the two continents, too, because one of the things that I got from the book very clearly is it's a book of a man in exile who is enormously sad about the continent he can't go back to. I got it's that same in sense as well. It's an India that he can't return to. It's quite nostalgic. In some respects, actually, it was interesting thinking about the books. Quite a lot of these books evoke a place that you can't go to. And this was colored by a sense of a place that he grew up in, that his parents knew, but he can't go back to. Michelle Roberts. I thought it was an evocation of a lost paradise, and that's part of the great beauty of the book, the, the sensual evocations of a, of a lost Bombay, a lost India. That works wonderfully. And it parallels, I think, the way the mother's described, because she is grotesque, larger than life, a horror in many ways, but it's also about adoration, admiration, love. And it reminded me very much of Indian cinema, of those you know, enormous soap opera epics that are larger than life and full of colour and just flash at you. It's a cool book in a funny way. It's very witty, it's very playful, it's the most written of everything on the shortlist, but it's quite cool too. It isn't an emotional book, it doesn't give you emotional upheavals inside. Although it has some jokes, I don't mean to yes. say it that oh, that's pathetically, what I like. because it's a very good. dark shortlist in many ways and there is some real humour in this book. Howard? Who would be a literary critic? You go through the first four books and one complains that one would like them to be a little more airborne and one would like more wit and humour from them and then you get to Salman Rushdie and here it should be. And then there is the problem, here it should be. And then there is the problem of dealing with Salman Rushdie who is himself a heroic figure and to whose fortitude you cannot pay enough of a compliment and whose book itself is, it's not just a personal thing, whose book itself stands for... He has it where he throws this book into the fray. The fundamentalist mind would strike flat the thick rotundity of the earth, and this is a book which offers you the thick rotundity of the earth. He throws the book into his battle with the powers of dark. I mean, he genuinely is in a battle with powers I of dark. I feel a but coming, Howard. Can you get to it? Yes, I think, he's, I, I think it's an immensely distressing book because I think it's hollow. Um, I, think it's, I think it shows us that the incarceration that he's suffered, or whatever you call it, he has paid for immensely. To me, it's a book absolutely hollow at its heart. I don't believe a word of it. What does it I don't mean to be find hollow? it funny. What does it, what does I it don't mean to be hollow? What, what does it mean to be hollow? It means that you don't believe in any of the characters, that you feel that the magic and the fantasticalness is worked up. I mean, immense energy get, and effort goes. And he's marvellous. I mean, he can, he can keep more balls in the air than any writer going. he's not writing going. a novel about characters, is he? I mean, he's not writing in that tradition. You that... have to believe if people walk into the sea and die, if people are blown up, if people commit suicide or break one another's hearts, you have to believe it. There's, there are descriptions you don't have of people to believe being... It. The novel, sure. We're reading novels. These are made-up yes. stories. The moment you don't when have to believe them. That's why I mean, it's like surely the that's movies. the whole point of the, of the, of the modern novel. I don't can believe. I mean, that you don't believe it's happening I mean, next realize you're so innocent. You, you can't have read, to believe. You cannot read a novel and not believe what's happening. If, if, a, if, a, if a novelist tells you that his hero is in love for the period that he tells you his hero is in love, you have to believe his hero is in love. Rule one. I Otherwise, think this is a very, I think Michelle's Otherwise, right. This is a very different doing? kind of novel. I think the source Send of it is intellectual. The, the source of it is intellectual source. And it's captured in the idea of the Alhambra. Uh, 
the East and the West, the Moors being driven out of Spain by Christianity, and out of that has become, out of this, the has, out, of this out of this has become the heart of the book. It's an intellectual book, and it's it is a book about history, and it's it is a book about big countries. Michelle, can you can you bridge this? I think for it's, last a, it's about narration. This book has a very strong narrator. He's he's riffing away. He's playing jazz, and we have to sit back and take it. That's what we have to do. Right. Can, can I ask you both, if you were judges now, which you all might have been, would how hard would it be for you to judge this the book as opposed to this the man as opposed to this the impossible. Because almost that's what's impossible. Going on out I there. think it's almost impossible to separate the two. It's such a hot, it's such a hot and such an emotional and sentimental and necessarily difficult issue. There's all our loyalty goes out to that stuff. All of us go out to that. And in a way it's in a way it's easy to be blind to be, to everything else. But in the name of what Salman Rushdie believes, the thick rotundity of the earth, I don't think we want to go on giving prizes to the same kind of book. Enough with magic realism. Not everybody likes it. And if the book's job is to introduce readers to different kinds of writing, n another kind of writing, please now. Bill Buford, do you think he's going to get it? I hope he will get it. I, I hope he will get it because I think it is the best book. Um, I think it is impossible to separate him, his book, from his history, but it's impossible to separate Pat Barker's last book from the previous two books, and actually very few of the rules apply because we're meant to have six books to be looking at anyways, and we've only got five, and with all possible, it's entirely likely we'll have five winners. I think that is very unlikely, and we're going to know very soon. But who do you think is going to win, Michelle? I want Pat Barker to win because I think it's a wonderful novel. I want to s celebrate Salman Rushdie's survival, and I want to show my political solidarity with him. There are lots of ways of doing that. Giving prizes is one way, but there are others too. Anyone who put money on it? Not a penny. I, I forgot. Believe, I believe Salman Rushdie. Justin Cartwright. Believe, believe... Justin Cartwright would right. be the heroic choice. Okay. I'll put a quid on Justin. All right. I have to say thank you all very much indeed, because that moment has come now. Will it be Book of History, I wonder? Back to Tracy McLeod in the hall. Thanks, Sarah. Now, Sir Michael Caine, Chairman of the Booker Prize Management Committee, will introduce the Chairman of the Judging Panel, George Walden, MP. L ladies and gentlemen, if I could now move to the importance of the evening, and I now ask George Walden, MP, Chairman of the Book of Judges for 1995 to announce the winner of this year, George. Ladies and gentlemen, in four minutes precisely, it will be my honor to announce the winner of the 1995 Booker Prize. First, a tribute to my team of judges. The novelist Ruth Rendell, to spook things up a bit, Kate Kellaway of The Observer, uh, Peter Kemp of The Sunday Times, and Adam Mars-Jones of The Independent. The press has been rightly complimentary about the choice of judges, especially The Observer, The Sunday Times, and The Independent. <laughs> In its 27 years, the Booker Prize has suffered many criticisms. It has been accused of literary snobbery. At least that's preferable to social snobbery. You meet a better class of person. It has also been accused of choosing books that are unreadable yet they have been read and enjoyed in their millions throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. And finally, the Booker Prize has been accused of popularizing erotic literature, be that as it may. Whichever way you look at it, 27 years of purveying unreadable eroticism to populist snobs is quite an achievement. <laughs> 141 novels were submitted for this year's prize. This is a record. It is also a testament to the vitality of the prize. If the literary novel is dead on its feet, as we are often told, it is putting up a pretty good show to the contrary. It is no reflection on the quality of the entrance that we selected five novels for the shortlist rather than the usual six. All it shows is that we differed strongly on what that sixth book should be. There were as many candidates as judges when we failed to agree on them, we could easily have fallen back on a compromise. 
to make up the numbers. I believe that we owed it to the prestige of the prize not to do that. And so here we have the final list. Pat Barker's The Ghost Road is the last book in her imposing trilogy about the First World War. In Every Face I Meet by Justin Cartwright is that rare and wonderful thing, a contemporary novel that matters. Barry Unsworth's morality play conjures up the Dark Ages, which I suppose makes it contemporary too. Salman Rushdie's entry, The Moor's Last Sigh, though set in India, ranges through eras and cultures. And Tim Winton, an Australian, makes us see Europe through new eyes in his strange and powerful book, The Riders. The custom is to say that it was a difficult decision. It wasn't easy. We read, we reread, we argued, and we agonized. And finally, our choice fell on the ghost road. If I could now ask Jonathan Taylor, chairman of B Booker, to make the gift. Thank you. I've been promoting this book for two months solidly now, so I'm heartily sick and tired of the sound of my own voice, and I'm certainly not going to go into great lengths today. I'd just like to thank my agent, Gillen Aiken, everybody at Viking and Penguin, with a particular thank you to my editor, Claire Alexander. But most of all, I want to thank the other writers for the very friendly and supportive attitude which has been shown by everybody throughout. But even more than the friendly and supportive attitude, I want to thank them for having written such wonderful books. Thank you. And so Pat Barker wins the 1995 Booker Prize. It's her first time on the shortlist and she's the first woman to win since A.S. Byatt with possession in 1990. Let's go back now to Sarah Dumans and her guests for a quick reaction. I think there was a genuine moment of silence in the hall with that and people were really quite surprised. Bill Buford? I felt a little bit, it was reminiscent of the verdict of the O.J. Simpson trial, and I think judges are a bit oh, like juries. They're completely unpredictable. Michelle Roberts. I'm delighted. It couldn't have happened to a better book. How, Jake? They've got it right. They've done everything right, I think. Apart from five books instead of six, they've done everything right this year, and they've got this right, too. Good on them. How do you think... I know you're a good friend of Salman Rushdie's. How do you think he will feel? Oh, I think he's, he'll be a bit disappointed, but I know he likes Pat Barker's writing. And, you know, at, at the end of the day, there's probably no more difficult task than writing a novel. And it's, I mean, at the end of the day, you actually want to support all the writers who are doing this weird, difficult what thing. What a wonderful look, acceptance speech. I have never heard a writer winning the Booker Prize give such a generous acceptance speech, praising the other writers and thanking them. That was beautiful. It's quite nice to see a woman win, too, after a great many years of no women winning and a great many years with only one woman on the shortlist. Michelle? Yes, this is usually a very male-dominated prize because male judges always outnumber women judges, so they got something right this year. Well, this year, Pat Barker won for The Ghost Road, Howard Jacobson, Michelle Roberts and Bill Buford. Thank you all very much indeed. And from all of us here at the Guildhall, a very good night and happy reading.